What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack a Day Podcast. It is the Wednesday edition of the show, which usually does not mean Mike Wall is joining us, but we had to make some adjustments this week, and thankfully, Mike is super flexible. It's all the yoga that he does. Mike, thanks so much for joining me again. You can follow him on Twitter at MikeWall68. Since we spoke last, unfortunately, there have been two Packer defeats at the hands of the Titans and the Eagles, two teams that punched the Packers right in the face. Packers showed a little bit of punch back this week against the Eagles, but it wasn't enough. Let me start by asking you, how are you doing, and how are you feeling about your Green Bay Packers? Andy, thanks for having me as always. Uh, I'm doing fine, thank you. Uh, I, I would say that uh, I'm probably in a better state. My family's in a better state than, than the Green Bay Packers are right now. Very true. But I, I'll tell you what, they made it interesting this weekend versus a good Philly team. Uh, this isn't a moral victory uh, league or certainly probably not a moral victory podcast that you, that you host, but we're trying to we, – you have – this is – this is looked like a team that could compete against another good team, which – Let's be honest, you haven't really seen for the last two months. I know they had the, the bright spot against the Cowboys, uh, but then got beat up a little bit by the Titans. There's some – there's – the more you watch this team, the more you just have to come to the conclusion that there's just not some pieces that need to be in place in order to be successful over the long term, and that could be – we could be talking about schematically coaching staff. We could be talking about personnel. But it's just, it just not a good enough team to compete at the level that they're required to compete at. No, I think we saw that. And like you said, this was there's there's bad teams that are awful to watch, which Green Bay has unfortunately been a good part of this season. And then there's bad teams that at least are enjoyable to watch. And it, while it was very difficult to watch this defense give up 363 rushing yards against the Eagles, at least this was a fun, entertaining game. We got to see some Jordan Love. Christian Watson did some fantastic stuff. There were signs of life from this offense. Keyshawn Nixon's getting 40, 50 yard kick returns. At least this was a fun game to watch, and at times, a fun team to watch, even if, like you mentioned, it's not a team that's ready to compete at the highest level, and it's a team that ultimately is going to have to learn a lot of lessons from this season going forward as they approach what's going to end up being an extremely important yeah. offseason in 2023. Yeah, and let me we, we asked this question on our show, uh, Mon and I. Let me ask you this. After watching three games of Rudy Ford, at safety in two games, and well, even one game with with Nixon returning kicks, but two games really with, with him returning kicks. Can you can you create a scenario in your in your brain where this shouldn't have been the default go to after week two? It just this this and this is kind of what I'm talking about. And then you go you come out. There's a much larger discussion about Joe Barry, and you know we don't see any problems at that position. You know, coming from the head coach. But you go well. These are this was two pretty significant upgrades uh, that could have been done at any point during the season, and you chose not to. And the the Nixon thing, I mean, good if if <laughs> if you don't know anything about football and you're just watching him run, yep. you go, oh, I'd like to have him on the field more, please. Like this is this isn't very hard. I don't need to know anything about football to know that he should be on the field because that man can run. He runs angry. He's smart. He's confident. Uh, where is where is this where has this been? I mean, he was half our offense. It, it's funny that you you talked about it with Amon. I talked about it with Aaron Nagler on his show this week. There there are far more things, or there are a few uh, things as, as infuriating as a team not understanding the own talent on their football team, right? Because it's one thing if you don't have the guys. It's one thing if your your scheme and your coaching isn't working. But it's another entirely. And the Amari Rogers, Keyshawn Nixon example is just like the glaring, obvious example, right? You have had not just this season, but all of last season, all of training camp, all of mini camp, all of OTAs to see that Amari Rogers, A, can't catch the punt. If he does catch the punt, he's a risk to fumble it. Even if he does catch the punt, doesn't fumble it. He has no upside as a returner uh, to actually make people miss and get vertical and north and south of the field and far too much east and west. There's no upside and there's extreme downside. And at the same time, you've got Keyshawn Nixon, who is very clearly dynamic with the ball in his hands. And listen, if, if you had concerns about him maybe catching punts and that was a, an issue of why you didn't want to put him back at punt returner, like... OK, but the guy that you had out there already couldn't catch them. And clearly, as a kick returner, he is way more dynamic. So to your point, the fact that they had this guy 
on the roster from very early in the offseason and before mini camps and OTAs even kicked off in Keyshawn Nixon. And the choice was to go with an Amari Rogers over him for as many weeks as that took. That's inexcusable. And then it took you until week 13 uh, or week 12 um, to bench Darnell, Sa basically demote Darnell Savage. He, it looked like he was going to be the dime defensive back. They went from him being the, the starter in base to playing nickel to now being the dime defensive back and promoting Rudy Ford up. But again, that took you this far into the season when the season was basically already over to make that change. Rudy Ford's been my second best defender on the team. And the way that Kenny Clark's been playing as of late, I'm not so sure that he isn't the, the top defender right now on this team. And even if like- As far even, as demeanor. Exactly. Is. Like yeah. even, even if he's not the most talented guy, like the guy- plays fast like he's aggressive he's making things happen he's ripping the ball out so Quay Walker can get a return like you just need those guys and I thought like Keyshawn Nixon even not even including the kick return had a really nice day as a slot corner as well and was one of the only guys on the field that was consistently tackling mm -hmm. like you just you just need those guys on your defense and yeah I'm, I'm totally totally with you yeah it, it's tough to uh that I think that part of the the sport is the most difficult because you obviously have to you'd be a fool not to start debating whether or not that was a business move or that was a football move and how many of those are being made and, and what else is, is, is out there, not only from a player standpoint, but what else are we not doing that we could be doing because we're either too pig headed or bull headed, whatever the, the term is you want to look, or we're just afraid to hurt somebody's feelings and we're not making the business decision that we need to be making. But yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's for people smarter than me to talk about, I guess. <laughs> exactly. But it's a, it's a production and a, you know, a base business and you have to produce results. And I was, I was interested to see um, what Matt LaFleur was going to do because he, he kind of made mention in his press conferences prior to that game that they were going to have to start looking at some changes. The, the big tell was that when they were talking about the communication on defense and things that were broken down and basically him saying, hey, we've been communicating the right things to the players. Basically, for, for a coach who has always put it on him, he was the one that was saying at this time, hey, we, we've said we communicated it effectively and it isn't being done. We're going to have to look at making, you know, basically making changes if – um, if, if those communications aren't being done effectively. And to me, and like I said, we, we can't tell on film, right, who, who made the miscommunication. That's a tough thing to break down. But I can mm -hmm. tell you, and I'm sure you've noticed as well, a lot of times when those miscommunications were happening, Darnell Savage was involved in the play in some capacity. I can't say it was always Darnell Savage. I have no idea. But when you start seeing the same guy pop up over and over, you're like, all right, there's probably smoke and fire to this. And um, it was him that they ultimately decide to demote and play Rudy Ford more, play Keyshawn Nixon more. And then on the offensive side of the ball, the other player that to me that screamed, all right, there's you have to go in a different direction was Sammy Watkins. Sammy mm -hmm. Watkins played a total of four snaps, which to me, quite frankly, was probably four, still too many. I would like to see Samore Toure, somebody else get those four snaps, but um, a clear demotion for him. And he got zero targets in that game. So two players who in a production, you know, results oriented business had not put up the results. Finally in week 12, we saw get that demotion and not play quite as much. Yeah, and it's a step in the right direction, certainly. And as a as a former player, I never like you never like to see guys not perform or not kind of be able to live up to their expectations, live up to their personal expectations. It's always really interesting to me, and this is the hard part about team sports, because there's there's certainly when you look at coaching staffs, and I, I'm not talking about just about Matt LaFleur's, but you talk about anybody in the league, the the loyalty from head coach goes directly to coaching staff. They might talk about loyalty to the team and, you know, how everybody's one unit, but the loyalty goes to the coaching staff. And so it's always it's always extremely interesting to me when you look at a guy like Darnell Savage, when you look at a guy like like uh, Amari Rogers or, or even Sammy Watkins. You know, the people that are coaching those players um, have expectations for them. Uh, maybe they maybe they have um, – Maybe they have quotas that they have to meet as far as plays or, or, or the types of plays, the number of plays. But there's there's a mandate that, that has been given out for Sammy Watkins this year, for example. And if the person in that room can't get the job done, you know, it's what's always interesting just being being on that side of the business before is, you know, being able to go out and say to the, to the head coach, like, this person cannot handle the workload or, or I am not capable. I mean, I had to say this to a coach about a guy one time, like, given the amount of time that given where he's at, given what your ex expectations are of him, and given and, and given the time you're giving us to speak with him, to work with him, 
I'm not a, I'm not capable of installing an entire playbook in three days, whatever it is. Like we need to yeah. cut down his stuff and make sure he's better at it. And there's always a disconnect, I think, between what the expectations are, what the reality is, and then what we're willing to say in that meeting room to not hurt people's feelings. And, and that's where I think this – it looks like this Green Bay Packers team is creeping towards, but they need to get there pretty fast. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's uh, it's been overblown for a while uh, a while to some extent of the the structure in Green Bay where it's Mark Murphy and then he's got Brian Gutekunst and Matt LaFleur and Russ Ball all reporting up to him. Uh, but I do also wonder if some of those disconnects of like an Amari Rogers or, you know, a, a Darnell Savage, is there pressure um, from the GM to keep his third round pick on the field? Is there pressure from Matt LaFleur? Like, and we don't know. I'm not, I'm clearly just speculating here. It could be nothing. It could be something. But um, sometimes you get competing interests of which players you want on the field. Usually it's GM has final say on the 53. Coach has say on who actually plays on game days. There can be disconnects there as well. But um, it's, a, it's a team that hasn't seemed to always be functioning on the same page with, as you kind of mentioned at the forefront, of not having their most talented players on the field throughout the course of this season. Let, let me give you an example from another team that probably it very well could apply here. So when I was on the coaching staff in Miami, and this, and, and when I was a player in Green Bay, the same thing would happen at, at the player level. You had to sit in on, on the on game plan day. The scouts would come out. Remember, every coach on, on a staff watches at least four tapes, full tapes of their opponent, okay? We've got a pretty good idea what's going on, particularly the people that you have to work directly against. We would have to go into a meeting and listen to the personnel department talk about the quality of, of the athletes on the other team. So, like for example, let's talk about defensive line. Right. And they would grade them out. Are they, are they blue chips? Are they, are they good starters? Are they elite? Are they average? Are they below average? They had, you know, color-coded and everything. And you'd sit there and you'd go, um, Okay, well, I've watched I've watched four tapes on them. I know all their moves. I know all their tendencies. I, you know, I, what are you, what are you telling me? And what they were telling you is this is the player that we would want to pick up. And you know, it, 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 but it has the point is it has very little to do with the actual production on the field. Right. It has a lot to do with the the tangibles and all the things that you see that the personnel guys look at it a little bit differently. Big time. So Amari Rogers could have all the tangible qualities that you want. But if the guy can't run the ball very well, if he, if, if he can catch it, none of it really matters because the, the personnel guys are saying, the personnel guys are always saying, Andy, if you can coach this guy better, he'll be an all pro. And the coaches are saying, why don't you just give me the guy that has the all pro mentality and I'll coach him to be an all pro. And yeah. that's where the disconnect usually is. Yeah, no, for sure. And there, there's always been that disconnect between the scouts and the pro personnel guys and like the actual coaches on the field, which is what was it? Uh, you know, was it Bill Parcells who said, you know, he want if he was going to have to cook with the, you know, be the chef, he wanted to at least buy some of the ingredients. Um, so there's th this has been a, a long going on, you know, ongoing uh, uh, discussion between coaches and, and personnel people. And like I, I I appreciate both sides. I appreciate the fact that the, the scouts need to say what this player is going to be. There's an anticipation of what they can become. And coaches have to be like, I don't care what this guy's going to be in two or three years. I need this guy to go out and play 50 snaps for me right now. What he is in two years is irrelevant to me at this moment. So there's always those competing interests. Um, so yeah, it's always interesting, but there does seem to be at times, especially right now with this team, a little bit of a disconnect and uh, listen, th this is a, a total different podcast for a total different day. Um, but it's one of the issues that uh, I've had at times with the Ted Thompson, Brian Gutekunst regime is they're, they're always, you know, always looking to the future, which is what you're supposed to do as a GM. Um, but never fully engaged in the here and the now, even when you have a team that's ready to compete. And I know that's a lot of the criticism towards a Jordan Love draft pick in 2020 and those sort of things. But at some point, th let's just put it this way to make it succinct, there is always going to be a team or two or three that is going all in on any given season. There's going to it's just like the way that we're at now. Obviously, the Rams were the shining example of that last year. We've seen the Buffalo Bills, the Philadelphia Eagles do that in a large way this year. There's going to be the, the Buccaneers when they won the Super Bowl with Brady, all in uh, mentality. There's always going to be a handful of teams that are just going for it and doing everything they can. And if you're just constantly you know, hey, we're not going to go all in because we never want to have that dip. We never want to have that, um, 
you know, the, the year where we end up four and eight uh, on a season, if you never have that moment where you actually go for it, you, all of a sudden you go 30 years and listen, I'm not, I'm not uh, taking anything away from two Super Bowl wins because I, I'll take it every day of the week, but all of a sudden you've got, you know, Favre and Rogers 30 years and you end up with only three Super Bowl appearances and two wins uh, over that time because um, you're always not wanting to mortgage any of the future to have a potential dip in the future, but never really recognize the now. And um, there's there's no easy way to do it. There's there's no GM that's mastered it, but it's uh, it, it's been definitely one of the things that I've struggled with at times through that through that era. Yeah, certainly that makes a lot of sense. I think when you look at it too, that they've had the luxury of having this star quarterback for so long here. I mean, I don't know what life's ever going to look like again. You know, when when he re decides to retire. Uh, talking about Aaron, but when you have 30 years of, of Hall of Fame play at that position, um, if anything, you would think that affords you a little bit more leeway to, to take those big bites every once in a while. And the fact that they haven't, you know, a, a great example of what you're talking about right now is is uh, is Quay Walker. You know, Quay is a, Quay is a phenomenal uh, athlete a, a, and, and, a, and a guy that can play at the pro level at a high level right now. But there's things about Quay's game that don't translate very well to a roughhouse football game in the National Football League. And we we put up a tape last night. I mean, there's 150 yards of him just not hitting the hole hard enough, you know, in the in the run game or, or missing a read on, on Jalen Hurts in like seven plays. Yep. And it's and it's not that it's not that he's a bad player, it's it's that he's a developing player. But you have multiple players on your team. That could do that do the job for that particular team against that particular that particular scheme that do the job better than he does, and they are being taken out of the game in certain situations because of his range. Well, his range doesn't matter if he can't take on a block, for example. And until you teach them that, and that's the disconnect. It's just interesting, right? Because. The coach, like the coach, sees that. And the coach is okay. We have to teach them that, but maybe they don't feel like they have time right now. So yep. Maybe they'll feel that's the priority. Maybe they feel the priority is installing the scheme. That's what a lot of coaches do these days. But the the GM, the personnel guy is like, no, you don't understand. The he's got to be on the field. He's the best athlete that we have, and they might be right, yeah. right. But that it is, it's it's a really interesting dynamic. I've always thought it was very interesting, Andy, that that coaches, you know, a coach can get fired in one year. You don't, you rarely see a GM get fired after one year or even two. Yep. You can see a coach getting fired after uh, uh, two years, maybe even one if they, if something goes, you know, absolutely awful. I mean, the Urban Meyer situation or something. But but coaches have such a short term outlook on life because they know that they it's a three year fire cycle or three year hiring cycle. That the the part that we are missing collectively as the league, and you can see a little bit with this team, is you miss the development factor, and that's where that like we really want to talk about the disconnect. The disconnect is. We see what they could be, we see what they are, and we're not bridging that gap because we feel like we have to, like there's, we have to win right now, or we have to insert that other piece right yeah. now. And it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough to watch. Let me tell you, as, as a former guy, it's tough to watch. It, it is, is tough and, to watch. One of the the videos I did recently is, uh, it feels to me that we've reached a time because the Packers are a draft and develop team, right? They draft, mm -hmm. they want to develop these players. I, I don't know. I don't know if you can do that still in today's NFL with consistency. Um, but as you mentioned, I, I think this coaching staff is a very is a scheme based coaching staff and they're getting ready to game plan and scheme for the next game. I don't know that there's a ton. I don't know that we've seen a ton of development for, from these players in, in the Matt LaFleur era. And that just goes again to a disconnect of you have a, a draft and develop front office, but you've got a scheme and game plan coaching staff. And I was talking about this with Ben Fennel online a, a little bit as well of like, it's, it's a, you know, like, if you have got a couple of Quay walkers on your team, right? Like you can, you can probably get away with that and, and that can be okay. Yeah. But this team has a lot of Quay walkers, meaning that you've got a lot of guys that from week to week or from play to play can look really freaking good but also just show that they need so much refinement and so much work. I'm talking about the John Runyon Juniors, the Josh Myers, the Eric Stokes, the Quay Walkers, the Kingsley and Igbares, the TJ Slaytons. Like we could go on and on. Darnell You're Savage. You're right. You know, there's so many of those guys. Darnell Savage, great point. Like uh, there's so many of those guys on this team that from play to play, 
I don't know if I'm going to get an A. I don't know if I'm going to get an F. And I don't know if I'm going to get anything in between. And that sometimes is like the toughest thing because like my, we've talked about Myers, right? We could put a, a cut up of Josh Myers on almost any given game. And if you gave me the right five plays, I'd be like, man, that guy looks like he can you know, play on any given Sunday against any defensive lineman and potentially even dominate that game. And then there's another five plays that if you pick the wrong five plays, you'd be like, dude, is this guy an NFL player? And the fact that you don't know what you're going to get on a down by down basis from some of these guys. And again, if it's going to be an A or an F, one or two, three of those guys spread out between offense, defense, special teams, by all means, you can you can get around some of that if they've got the talent and you live with some of that. But this is a team that has so many of those guys that it makes it tough to show consistency on a down in and down out basis when you need, when it's a sport that you need all 11 guys to be on the same page, doing the same thing. And if one guy, just one guy screws something up, all 10 other guys could have everything perfect. And if one guy screws that up, the whole play is a goner. And you've got too many of those guys that have that one play at different times throughout the game. And like collectively you go through it and you're like, yeah, you know, some of these guys aren't grading all that bad, but it's like every play, one of the guys is having their bad play. And all of a sudden you've got 30 plays on offense that are messed up because one, you know, one guy sure. each screwed up three times. Yeah. It, there's a, there's a great, uh, a soccer coach told me one time that the best thing you could hope for is you know, obviously consistency, but he measured it like on, on a scale of one to 10, the expectation for a pro is that you should be somewhere between a six and a nine every single game. Yeah. You can, you're probably never going to be a 10. On the best day, you'll probably be a nine, but you can never be lower than a six. If you're lower than a six, you don't belong in the, in, in that league. Yeah, and and that's kind of where um, when once you get to a certain point, I think as a player that you go, I'm never lower than a six. Then you, you kind of feel like, okay, I have the confidence to to go out there and produce every day. But I I completely agree with everything you just said. Um, this is this is not this is a draft and develop team historically. I do not think they spend a ton of time on development and if you just want to point to they do not win single blocks very often on the offensive line in the run game and they do not tackle very well and those are kind of the most basic things in the sport and we don't do any we don't do either of them very well honestly well we got off on a very fun tangent i want to ask you a, a few a few different things uh both about this game and kind of where this team is headed um i want to start by talking about the defensive side of the ball we talked about 363 yards allowed tackling one of the biggest issues, not getting off some of those blocks along the defensive line. Of course, uh, the, the solution to all the problems is just fire the defensive coordinator, and that will solve obviously everything according to Twitter and, and all the fans online. Um, I, I certainly am not here to necessarily defend Joe Barry. I don't think that this has necessarily been a, a stellar effort on his part. Um, but I want to ask you, A, what what would a what does a coordinator change? Do? I don't know if you've gone through a coordinator change in season in your career. Okay, um, what does does that actually do anything for the team? And B, do you think that it's time for a coordinator change in Green Bay? Would you do that in season on the defensive side of the ball? So a coordinator change, you it's just like when you fire the head coach, you replace an interim coach. It's usually a blip in performance, right? It usually bumps up and then they'll return to mean unless the guy actually makes a meaningful difference, which. You know, like, like when, when we used to struggle offensively, they didn't fire Rosley, but they gave the play calling duties. Mike took the play calling duties back, and then we right. were good again. And it wasn't a coincidence. Like, he was, he was just a better play call. Um, so I think there is – I think that, that that can have an impact if you have the right people. You know, the thing, the, the, the thing that I take issue with with uh, what's going on in Green Bay right now is, is honestly the tackling. They're so poor at it. They've been so poor at it. They, they clearly don't spend any – they don't spend any meaningful time on it. And we can say, well, you know, the, the, they're in the right position to make plays and they're not playing. And it's like, okay, well, then you've got the wrong people in and that's your job too. Yeah. You know, so it's either you're either not coaching them or, or you, you didn't have Rudy Ford in the game, you had Darnell Savage. So which, you know, which reason do you want to be fired for, I guess? You know, that that's kind of how I look at this. I think the problem now is I think Matt – with his comments in the paper has dug himself into this, this foxhole pretty heavily. And that there's, I mean, listen, if you run the ball 49 times in the Green Bay Packers and give up 363 yards on defense, and this isn't the time to make a move, then there never will be. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, Justice Mosqueda on Twitter basically said, like, if, you know, Matt LaFleur made mention prior to the week that, like, everyone's job's on the line. Joe Barry clearly knows that he's fighting for his job at this point. If this is the way that the defense responds with, you know, kind of job on the line and you give up 363 yards of rushing and, and can't stop the Eagles at all, um, that's basically all we need to know at that point. And uh, I'm kind of been on the page of, like, I don't know what it really does in season at this point. There's nobody on staff that has coordinator experience besides Jerry Gray. Jerry Gray's defensive backs haven't exactly been a stellar example of uh, how to play defensive backs. They haven't been able to communicate effectively on the back end. So it's like, do you really want to promote that guy? So I, I don't know what it does at this point. I think it probably is a foregone conclusion that they probably make a change in the off season. So I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm on the fence either way about it, but um, I do think it gets done eventually and whether they do it, you know, now or by week at the end of the season, I'm not sure how much that actually matters. Um, on the flip side of the ball, you've got the whole quarterback discussion, which is, of course, dominating the conversation as well. You've got your established MVP quarterback who's having a tough season in large part because his thumb's broken and now he's got battered up ribs. Um, we're not sure the extent as we're recording this uh, today. Um, we haven't heard any more on scans or if he's going to be able to play. Aaron's take on it is that if they're mathematically in the playoff race, which they technically are, and if he's capable of going, which it sounds like he might be able to, that he wants to play in the game. It sounds like Matt LaFleur is of that same mind that if he can go, he's going to go. Uh, Jordan Love, very small sample size, 10 plays, nine throws, one rough pass to, to Christian Watson on the run in the back of the end zone. Maybe probably should have just taken Lazard short or at least given Watson maybe a little bit of a better ball. But outside of that, showed good footwork, showed good anticipation, ripped the ball, found guys that were open, let the receivers do the heavy lifting like Christian Watson on uh, the play where he takes it however many yards for a touchdown. Um, where where stands Mike Wall on the Jordan Love, Aaron Rodgers, and how the Packers should navigate this for the remainder of the season? Well, it kind of it, this all this stuff kind of folds in together to, to me because you're four and eight, you're not going to make the playoffs. I think there's a 2% chance or something, but you're not going to yep. make the playoffs. And, you know, it's... <clears throat> For me, it's are we are we looking forward? You know, who, well, I guess there's two questions. Who's running the show, right? Because because if Goody's running the show, then he probably wants to see Love to see if it's you know can we get do we need to trade Aaron? Do we need to trade Jordan? Because they got to make that they got they got to make the fifth year option decision next year. And if Aaron's here, he's not gonna, Jordan. You're not going to see Jordan on the field again. Um, so there's that question. But if if we're four and eight, and what we're trying to do right now is finish strong, but also finish strong in the context of we want to see who's going to be playmakers for this team next year, then you got to play your best players, you know, and your best player is Aaron. Um, he gives – because he's going to give those young receivers the best chances to be successful. He's going to make the offensive line look, you know, if he's healthy. He, just the, from an experience standpoint, getting into the right plays, all of that stuff, he's just going to be able to do better than Jordan Love. Jordan Love – right now is just doesn't have the, the football intelligence, doesn't have the savvy that, that Aaron Rodgers does. But if you're trying to figure out – if you're trying to figure out what you have because because we've decided the season's – you know, mathematically or not, the season's over, and we've got a lot of a lot of big money decisions to be made with actually both quarterbacks, the way it's the way it's sounding out in, in, the, uh, in the media world. Yep. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I haven't said this all year, but – I could see a scenario where, where Jordan Love finishes out the season, maybe after next week. I think the same thing. And it, it feels like, and I'm hopeful that this can sort of happen organically, where you know, Rodgers in his press conference after the game said something to the extent of once they're mathematically eliminated, he's open to conversations and different scenarios at that point. It seems like he would maybe be at least open to talking about, all right, do we want to shut down with the thumb and the ribs and see Jordan Love and those sort of things once they're mathematically eliminated? If he's open to that, and if he's able to play this week, it seems like he gets his game against the Bears. Then they have the bye week. The odds that they're still mathematically in it, even if they defeat the Bears after the next two weeks, are probably relatively slim. At that point, and especially coming after a bye, you transition to love. You shut down Rodgers, who has the injuries. Probably put him on IR uh, for the remainder of the year. Let Jordan Love get, what, four games at that point, um, which should give you know everyone enough opportunity to, to evaluate where he is as a quarterback. To me, that just makes all the sense in the world all the way around. And I, I totally understand um, that, like, hey, if Rodgers is going to be back next year and, and you know that, 
then yeah, you know, getting Dobbs and Watson and Torre and those guys on the field to develop a better rapport with Aaron, get Deguara out there a little bit more, um, you know, work with that offensive line and, and let those guys see what they can do because quietly the offense over the last three weeks, averaging 27 points per game, putting up points against the Cowboys and the Eagles, which are two pretty darn good defenses um, for a team that's kind of falling apart. The offense has actually bizarrely shown some impressive signs of life these past few weeks. So I can understand wanting to get that consistency so that that's not something that you have to work on all of a sudden to start next year as well. But uh, it just feels like it, there's a organic resolution to this with you know, Rogers with the, the team probably being eliminated from the playoffs, Rogers being beat up and you wanting to kind of get an eye on Jordan Love for a few weeks. Yeah. And I think the big thing is at least just been going through, you know, I, I was, I was not on the team when, when Brett threw, went through all his drama with, with Green Bay, but I was kind of part of that story. And I think it's just so critical that they handle this correctly with Aaron and they have this conversation now before he gets to the, you know, before he gets to the media, before he goes on, you know, Pat's show, whatever, you know, whatever, like have the conversation now, just get it. Over. Let's have a plan. Now you're four and eight. If you can play, we're going to play you after the bye week. Let's, let's see if we're mathematical, but have a plan. And just, I just like all of this kind of this, the fact that they haven't addressed this and maybe they have, maybe they already have a plan, but the fact that at this stage, that they have, they don't kind of know exactly how this is going to play out, whether or not he's healthy or not healthy. Andy is kind of what we're talking about with everything with this team. You know, it's just, it's it, it just feels it, this feels like something that has to be right. They have to get this right. You do not want to go into another off season with Aaron, you know, talking about respect and and wanting a bigger seat at the table. You, you just don't. You don't want it. You don't need it. It's not good for anybody. And the longer it goes on, the longer you don't have that conversation, the more opportunity for there is, you know, like when you have space in the void, things will fill up that space, right? And the whispers and the, the you know, the rumors and everything all of a sudden starts filling that. And is there discontent? And like all this, like just have the conversation, rip the Band-Aid, get it over with put your plan, uh, get your plan set moving forward. Like you said, maybe they've done this, maybe they haven't, tough to say. Um, they could be just all, you know, keeping it all in house, but um, the sooner you can have that conversation, the better it probably is. All right, last thing before we, we get out of here, we have to, to rant and I want you to be able to go off Elton Jenkins as probably the block of the season for the Green Bay Packers um, on the, the toss play to Aaron Jones, gets called for the holding. It was a picture, per, in my opinion, a picture perfect block. Could not have done that any better. A beautiful pancake, the stuff that offensive line uh, lineman dreams are made of. And of course, it gets called for a penalty on the play. Mike, the floor is yours. Your take on the Elton Jenkins block that was but got taken away. I, I watched it again, uh, end zone copy. And the thing that's amazing about, I mean, Elgin Jenkins, he's a, he's a, he's a very unique athlete and there's some things that he does better than others, but he is a incredibly powerful human. Um, he can really deliver power through those hips. And so he is trying to reach, uh, um, 97, what's the 97's name? Hargrave. Uh, yeah. He's trying to reach Hargrave and he actually has his outside hand free. He doesn't even touch him with his outside hand. And so what's amazing is he, and it's very rare that this happens, but he actually gets his inside hand into the padding armpit area, which we're all, that's what everyone's aiming for. Yep. And he ends up getting it and able to like same foot, same shoulder, punch and extend that arm and literally flip him in the air. You see his feet flying. He lands on his back and, you know, that's one of those plays where if they score a touchdown, they go on to win, even if they don't go on to win the game, that is on, like, Brian Baldinger is putting that on. Every single player or, you know, guy in the league is out there. All of a sudden, Jenkins is back to being a hot commodity. Like, that one play could have changed his whole perspective for the season. Yep. And that and those guys make what is an absolutely awful call. And of, of the hundreds of awful calls that the referees make, that was that was pretty egregious. 
I'm happy at least that the Packers were still able to score a touchdown on that drive because had that, you know, um, caused them not to score a touchdown, that would have been even more frustrating. I think that was the Aaron Jones touchdown in the back of the end zone drive, if I remember correctly. But Two plays later. man, like just a beautifully blocked play all the way around. Jones gets the touchdown. It's, it's a it's a perfect execution play. And like you said, just a, a special play that most players can't make. And um, there's no hold in any way, shape, or form on that play. So to get called for it, certainly frustrating. I, I get you don't see Hargrave, you know, getting thrown to the ground that often. And, you know, you feel like something must be amiss and that he must have done something illegal. But just a, a truly special play. And we'll, we'll wrap it up. I, I actually thought Elton Jenkins over the course of the last few weeks, not quite Pro Bowl caliber level Elton Jenkins that we saw maybe prior to the injury, but – Showing much better signs than he did at tackle early in the year. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Uh, the last two weeks in particular, uh, this game you can even look at, you know, there's, there's some, you know, what's, what's interesting is, and we talked about it a little bit before, like we don't, we don't do a good job of winning one-on-one blocks. And I'm not saying the complete domination like that one. And that's probably what's, what's so unfortunate. It's like that was the most dominant one, one-on-one block that we've had. And, and they of course call the penalty, but we don't even, get what you would just call like a, a stalemate, you know, like, yeah. And what happens is more often than not, when you see that, if you just took all our run plays and you see the plays that work and don't work, our double teams are very good. And, and Elgin Jenkins runs the best inside lane of a double team that we have by far or mm-hmm. outside lane. So whether he's working with Myers or whether he's working with Bakhtiari, he is the best by far on double teams. And they create, he creates a lot of space in the running game just by his ability just to kind of stay on track when he does, when he runs his Bs or he runs his play side gaps. Um, what we struggle with is like Bakhtiar in, in EJ, they struggled with this last week. One of them looks like they're running in the inside zone, walling somebody off. The other one looks like they're running outside zone, trying to stretch. And it's just, I don't know if they're not on the same page or one of them's just, you know, got the technique wrong. It's, it's 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 perplexing because it doesn't make sense because they're both high level players and it happens like opposite opposite you know every other time, but EJ has you know he plays at a high level he's a really good player he's he's one of those guys we talked about because of his unique be, uh, ability to bend and, and generate power from his hips he can play with kind of a little bit different technique than a lot of guys where he can take that inside hand and kind of go up and under and grab the pads here that's kind of that's a technique that guys like Steve Hutchinson were, were, were really good at. But guys, you know, some guys don't operate that well because you don't want to get those people that close into your body because now you're fighting power on power. But he's he's a special guy. Uh, he's only going to get better. He can he could dramatically improve, I think, some of his footwork, um, you know, starting with how he comes out of a stance. But uh, I think next year you're going to see – you know, him being back to a, a Pro Bowl level and, and possibly higher. There's there's only a handful of really good guards in this league, and I, I certainly think he's in the conversation to be one of them by next year. Unrestricted free agent. ESPN has him as the number three free agent in football. Green Bay doesn't have oh. a ton of money to spend. Uh, that is going to be a very interesting offseason decision. They probably can't use the franchise tag based on where they're at with the salary cap as well. So that is going to be a very interesting decision alongside – a decision on David Bakhtiari, who is set uh, to make significant money and they can get out of a fairly decent chunk of that if they want to move on in the offseason as well. They, so, they ha- Andy, don't they have to keep him? I mean, he he's 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 as good as anybody in the league still. I know he's I, been hurt and this and that. I, I mean, I get it, but if 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 you can say if you can say <coughs> can we can we you know can the a statistician say that we're gonna he's gonna get fourteen games? It would be worth it. He's he's so good. I, I can't even begin to say like how far like above I have him like than any other offensive lineman on the team right now. He's just like since coming back, he's just he's just I can't. Even, I was talking about this yesterday. The amount of times that he just engages with a defensive lineman and the defensive like the defensive lineman's just dead on arrival. Like you, yeah, you, you can't. And yeah, he can't do anything. But it's just it's just cruise control. And the Green Bay doesn't have anyone else. That's even close to that where they like, it's just Bakhtiari goes, does his thing and it's just over, done with. You don't have to worry about it. It's set it, forget it. Um, he's, I, I missed watching him play over the last season and a half that he was missing and watching, watching him play again, even at like probably what 80% of himself probably at best is still so much better than almost anyone else. And it's, it's just crazy how talented and how skilled he is. He's a, he's a he's a special player. He's, he's fun to watch. He's got all those kind of awkward stances, and you're trying to figure out how everything works. And then 
he just like you said, he just he he's not a he's not a dominant guy. Like if you if you if you checked his knockdowns per game, like he's not like a Trent Williams guy. No, nope. but they just you're right. They people just disappear when uh, he plays against them. They just don't. They like the, the guy doesn't even exist. It's amazing. It's it's really really fun to watch. We'll have that uh, that Bakhtiari contract discussion on another episode because it's a it's a really intriguing one because the injuries mixed with the contract mixed with how well he's playing is just a it's a perfect storm for like what the heck are they going to do? I, I would love to see him on the team. Like he's one of my like I just said he's one of my favorite players ever to watch and he's still playing at an insanely high level. Um, but the risk with a guy like that who like one play away of like maybe never playing again like it's just. I don't know. It's a really interesting decision. So we'll have to revisit that. Mike, where can we follow you on Twitter and tell us about the uh, On My Block podcast? Yeah, Mike Wall 68 on Twitter. Uh, Aman and I do a show Mondays and Thursdays on my block Packers podcast. Um, I do a block party thing usually on Tuesdays or Wednesdays where I'll break down a player or players in the league. Uh, today I'm going to do, uh, I'm gonna actually going to do the trench warfare stuff on both sides, offensive and defensive line of this last Packers Eagles game. So that should be interesting. And you can check that out on YouTube backslash process to perform. Awesome. Everyone, make sure to check that out. Mike does a phenomenal job breaking down everything. So again, you can follow him on Twitter at MikeWall68. You can follow the podcast at Packaday Podcast. You can follow me at Andy Herman NFL. That does it for us today. Mike will be back next week. We'll, of course, have you covered 365 days a year right here on the podcast. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.